And welcome everybody. My name is Olivia Weatherburn and on behalf of Dairy NZ Federated Farmers and Beef and Lamb New Zealand, I welcome you to this winter crop planning webinar. As an industry, we want to ensure everyone has the tools and support farmers as winter crops are planned for win winter of next year and the years to come. And like most activities in the farming calendar, as soon as one finishes, we're planning the other. So we want to be able to make sure we can fit this around other farm tasks that need to happen on farm. As rural professionals and rural contractors, you have daily interaction with farmers either by phone before you get to the job or across the kitchen table or truck deck as part of the services you already supply to farmers across the country. This webinar aims to help enable everyone to have constructive conversations and understand good management practices when it comes to wintering from cultivation to grazing. And we thank you for joining us today. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. We are pushing the rural broadband connections to their limits today and with this great attendance. And we ask as much, we'd love to see you eating your lunch and your kids fighting in the background, that we ask that you keep your cameras off and remain muted throughout the presentation. Behind the scenes, we have two wonderful techs, Briar and Maria, who will be able to help with any technical difficulties you may have. If you have called in by phone today, and use the dial-in option, you won't likely be likely to see the slides we are going to be using. But do not fear, we understand that technology doesn't work for everybody, and everybody who has registered today will receive a copy of the slides we are going to use, and they'll be shared as part of the follow-up email tomorrow morning, as well as a recording from today. The check function for today's call can be found in the toolbar most commonly found on most devices at the bottom of your screen. We ask that all questions are submitted into here for us to answer at the question end of the webinar. Should you not be able to access or use the chat function, we ask that you text your questions to Maria on the number 027 556 8836, which you'll be able to see on the slide coming up now. As those presenters come on, we will turn the cameras on so you can see them. And Briar is going to do her best to spotlight them for you so they pop up into view easily. So just before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speakers. From Dairy NZ, hiding in the background, we have Ashley Greenwood, who is changing our slides, who has helped lead this project, and we're very thankful for that. Along with Senior Solutions and Development Specialist, Environment, Justin Kiddo, and Principal Scientist, Dawn Daly. You'll soon hear from Federated Farmers member, Chris Allen, and you also hear from the Beef and Lamb team, Tom Orchison, the South Island Environmental Capability Manager, and myself, Olivia Weatherburn. Today's focus will cover six main areas. Ashley, can you change the slide, please? And we must emphasize that none of us today are claiming to be experts. You all know the tools of your trade and we aren't here to tell you how to do your jobs. We simply want to ensure you feel supported to ensure in turn, you can support farmers. I'm now going to pass on to Chris Allen from Federated Farmers. And Chris is going to take you through a little bit of a policy update and the unique season that we've had. So welcome, Chris. Good. Thanks, Olivia. Hey, so we've all had a unique season. It's the weather. Um, I'm in Canterbury, and we've had, since the 30th of May, a, nearly our annual rainfall in just the last um, three months. So we've got the weather, we've got staffing issues, we've got the borders and overseas staff, and those that can't get home or that those are still overseas and can't find a, a way to get to a job here. We've got the communication issues um, where farmers are isolated on farm and also being locked down. Being organised is really important. It, it actually takes away the stress from all our lives and that there's one thing we need to, to, to um, get on top of. So there is no such thing as an, a normal season. We can all fudge our way through 24 hours of rain, but when we get one week, one month, or a, a winter season that's exceptionally wet, 
then that really brings all the stresses right to the top. It's hard on the animals, it's hard on the land, and it's hard on the people. So contractors, we know that they're under a significant stress as well because they're running behind. Um, and at this stage, more like in Canterbury, they haven't been able to get to the land, but they are getting caught up in a hurry. So what is the key message in amongst that? Let's be organised. The farmers need to be organised. The advice to those farmers also needs to be organised so that the fertiliser is ready, the seed is ready, and that um, things can go on unimpeded, unimpeded. And so after a big long wet, we are running a little bit behind, but I'm sure we will all get caught up and there'll be less stress if we are organised. So why is good wintering so important? Well, it was in March we had it had the existing rules, they were deferred, or some of them were deferred. And then the industry at the same time, the regional councils were challenged to show how they could manage winter grazing, um, they could manage it well. And so we launched on to nationwide wintering campaigns, and that is where the likes of Federated Farmers, Beef and Lamb, Dairy NZ, FAR, um, and we had regional councils all working together, and MPI and MFE, trying to to get key and consistent messages. So those winter, proposed winter grazing rules, they were deferred until May 2022. And this gave the farmers the window of opportunity to manage their winter grazing well. Most of the paddocks had already been selected, the winter feed was in and growing. So you, it wasn't so much about saying we've got the wrong paddocks, uh, it's how we manage those paddocks well. And there's some key th themes that were brought to light. So the, the nationwide winter, wintering campaign was established and it was to promote the wintering good management practices and support the farmers on how they should um, execute those winter, um, winter practices. And the key messages were critical when making those decisions for, will be key for um, making the winter grazing decisions for winter 2022. And it starts right at the very beginning and that is from the selection of the paddock and make sure that they're on the right slope and that there's access to the shelter and shade and whatever. So there's an opportunity that we've been able to show the government and the public that we've got this and that we do need rules, but they don't need to be as stringent and strict um, as what the regulations that we've been proposed. We need rules to show us the direction of travel and it helps some of those who aren't part of the program to uh, get part of the program but the main thing is it actually shows us that direction of travel. We after all are on a journey of continuous improvement. So we then move on to the winter grazing policy update. So currently at a national level, there's a land area for winter grazing. It's to be no greater than the highest amount used between July 14 and July and June 2019. And that, that's your permitted area activity. And there's also, at regional level, there are rules, whether it be in Canterbury and some other parts of the country that also have winter grazing rules. So if they are more stringent, they take precedence. However, from November 22, there's a six month delay. And then there's some consultation that's coming out. Um, I believe it'll be even later today, the government will be looking at it. So from November, November 2022, there is another six month delay. And it's largely, so the government has largely accepted the recommendations of the South and Winter Grazing Advisory Group. And they're talking about three pathways to meet the default conditions or a freshwater farm plan. So we won't talk about the freshwater farm plan at this stage, but what they're talking about is deleting or altering some of those problem, some of those areas that were so problematic and so prescriptive in the previous, um, National Environmental Standard, but it is going out for public consultation. So it's not guaranteed that this is what will be ended up, but it is highly likely that it will be the, um, the direction that we, it will be. And I believe it looks very pragmatic. So the maximum of 10 degree slope is still remain. It's just the definitional issue around what that 10 degrees looks like. They have to manage the effects of pugging on the fresh water, the setback of five meters from waterways, and re as soon as practicable. That word practicable is by far the most uh, important because it, it, it um, 
deletes the dates that were prescribed in the National Environment Standards. And the other one is the protection of critical source areas. So these are what the, the these are the conditions that have been proposed. So when you go and look at this PowerPoint, you look at the, it's about the slope. This is the pegging rule. You're taking reasonably practical steps. The resign date, and that's reasonably practical, practicable. The new condition around critical source areas. So for all the real professionals, come up to speed. Make sure you know what a critical source area is, because the good management practices that are being implemented by the industry, we're all talking about critical source areas and making sure we're protecting them. This brings it into the regulation. And the setbacks from the drains, that's also been um, marginally amended, but it also includes um, some of the field, field tiles and drainage areas underground. There's no, no required changes to the area of a potential winter grazing. It would be the thresholds of the 50 hectares or the 10% area. So all in all, I think that there's heading in the right direction. I think it's been largely supported by most farmers as being practical, but there will be a consultation period and the details around how long there'll be is more than I can answer today, but we'll wait until it appears on the ministry website. So I will close off there and I'm happy to answer questions like later at the end. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Chris. For the remainder of the presentation, we are going to be focusing and expanding on the following good management practices around wintering and go into some in more detail, including those critical source areas and how to identify them. These practices are where you can be basing your conversations with farmers off and being able to support them and being able to implement them on your, their farm. We've been doing this for a number of years already, and it's been proven that if we can get good management practices right, we can reach and meet most rules around the country. So I'm now going to cover a, a bit of information in regards to paddock selection. So when considering crop areas, there is a number of steps we need to consider when it comes to determining that winter area. So why are farmers forage cropping? Because sometimes it's cause granddad did it and that's what they've continued to do. But we now need to be starting to have better reasoning around this. It's part of the rotation is usually one of the common answers. Could it be that being part of the rotation doesn't need to go back into winter crop? Could a summer crop be more suitable? Or is a grass to grass option just as viable? The need for winter feed, really doing some good planning in regards to the analysis around what is optimum when it comes to the winter feed required. And in regards to, it's just what we do. It's what we've done for years. Uh, is that the best way? Because in some places, does the farm system fit the land capability used for that farm? Are you just doing it for year, because that's what's been done in the years? And it may not be the right reason. Some places just aren't suitable for winter crops. So having some of those conversations now is a lot easier than when we're in the middle of winter. So when it comes to paddock selection, we need to understand the potential risks and consider those risks in each paddock. We need to be able to consider the strengths and weaknesses of different crop types for that farming system. As you know, winter grazing can increase the risk of sediment and harmful bacteria and nutrients ending up in the water. Steeper paddocks come with bigger risks. However, these farmers can manage these through the likes of buffers and critical source areas, and Justin is going to cover that next. Creating a winter plan, which we're also going to cover how you can just do this near the end of the webinar, is really important to being able to put those plans in place. What is the soil type? Actually considering, is it going to impact productivity, nutrient loss and animal welfare? As I said, taking these into account now, all these considerations is a lot easier than re re realizing the faults when those of you who are rural contractors are in the drive or the stock has arrived and it's been raining for four days during the winter and you realize you shouldn't have cropped this paddock. And these are the conversations we need to be having now with everybody to ensure everybody's considered all the options. So the table that's about to pop up on your screen is just giving you a little bit of a look in regards to 
a bit of a matrix. So uh, the further up the scale you go, there's more mitigations, there's more risks. But it's not saying it can't be done. You're just going to have to put some more management around it. So if we take into account, say, slope, for example, a flat paddock is good. The risks are a lot lower. It's not ideal if it's rolling, but again, it is manageable through those critical source areas and those buffers being used. And it's, the steeper it is, there is obviously more risks. So more than 10 degrees. There may be that you're going to need to require a really good plan and how you're going to mitigate those risks and a freshwater plan to be able to get away without having to have consents. Another example of that is in regards to waterways. Is there waterways? Are they going through the middle of the paddock or along the side of the paddock? It's just considering all these things now to determine whether the paddock is good or not. So again, it's this plan, plan, plan. And this is where as rural professionals, we can get involved in being able to help farmers through this process. We're gonna take you through some of the plans later on, but just an example here of what a draft plan look, can look like prior to sowing the crop. It's also very handy if farmers have these plans so when the likes of a rural contractor turns up on the, at the door that they can be given a map that's really self-explanatory in regards to what happens. We also need to take into consideration public perception as you don't know what you don't know and sometimes what people see is not exactly what's happening. A good example of this has been seen in Otago, where a couple of strips of kale around the road boundaries have been used. Uh, we've even seen maize and sunflowers in some places, and then fodder beet in the middle, just taking a wee bit away from that public reception. Again, not hiding anything, just being able to manage the situation. Where possible, planting crops and paddocks with good shelter is also advised. We can go through all these different steps and remember that different regional councils could also have different things for each region. So you are best to be actually work within your councils as well and make sure you look up those rules should there be any with your councils in different regions. So I'm now gonna pass on to Justin Kiddo who's gonna take you through critical source areas and buffering. Thank you, Olivia. Um, so critical source areas are landscape features such as swales or gullies, they're depressions in the landscape where they often come to prominence after there's been a considerable amount of rain and all the runoff, all the rainfall congregates in these different landscape features. And that, um, that photo on the top right is, is what we're looking at there. So this is some relatively flat land in Canterbury and in the middle of the paddock there's a critical source area and it's um, become prominent after a little bit of rain. Um, these features, these landscape features are really important because they can be a significant source of contaminant loss from farmland. And depending on whether or not you've got tile drains in, in the paddock, they could lose anywhere between 50 to 90% of the sediment, phosphorus and bacteria loss. So 50% if you've got tile drains and it starts increasing if you don't have tile drains in those paddocks are the very um, significant, significant for contaminant loss. And this is why um, it's one of the rule changes that's been recommended is that these landscape features are actually not cultivated for winter cropping and they've left in um, grass. So that picture down the bottom of the screen is an example of a sheep farm where the farmer has not cultivated the critical source area they've left it in grass, they've got a temporary fence around it to keep the stock out of it. And these particular farmers have um, gone even further and they've put a silt fence as well to act as an extra, um, an extra um, mitigation step to reduce sediment loss. Um, these features um, can sometimes be a bit difficult to, to find in the landscape, particularly for, for less experienced people. They're often, um, I think the best way to go and find them is just to walk into a paddock after there's been a considerable amount of rain and look for parts of the paddock where um, water has congregated, where water is ponding, and particularly um, where it's running off the paddock as well into a drain, into a culvert, and into a waterway. Uh, that's the most common way to find them, but there's also um, the river environment classification which is a GIS tool maintained by NIWA 
and it uses um, radar digital elevation models to plot where critical source areas could be. Um, and so that's the more scientific solution, but that iometer in the paddock is quite an important tool. Um, another way of looking at it is um, wherever you have a toll of a slope, there's the risk of having a critical source area as well. The more um, undulating or rolling the landscape becomes, the more frequent these critical source areas will, will occur, but they also do occur on flat land as well. So even if you're on the Canterbury Plains, which are pretty much dead flat, you, um, you, um, you, you do get them as well. I've just seen a question pop up as to whether a tile drain or a sinkhole is a critical source area. So a, t a tile drain is not the true definition of a critical source area, and there's potentially going to be some modification to the rules to exclude tile drains from being critical source areas. But a, a sinkhole or a soak hole could potentially be seen as a critical source area as well, depending on um, the definitions applied locally to, by regional councils. Um, and another point I'd like to make is, while um, it's great that many farmers are starting to leave these critical source areas uncultivated, leave them intact, which is good, um, it's important that you do communicate that with the farm team. Um, because we've got examples around the place, unfortunately, where farm decision makers have done the right thing and, and left the critical source area intact, but farm staff just haven't got the memo and they don't understand why, and they've ended up running tractors through them, running animals through them, um, removing temporary fences to allow stock access to them as a standoff area during a wet event, um, running motorbikes up and down them, and in the end, they've just become completely trashed in a, in a muddy cesspit, really. So it's important that those messages are communicated to farm staff. And here goes just a couple of examples, different examples. That photo on the left is a photo of, um, a, of a critical source area that has been left intact um, by the by a track driver. And then that example on the right, there's two things going on in this example. Um, the, when the paddock was cultivated, they did leave a buffer around those critical source areas. But what this farm has also done is they've left a last bite or of crop that in this situation, they'll probably go in towards the end of the season when it's a little bit less risky to um, utilize that last bit of crop. Um, which is appropriate, but one of the things I'd, I'd recommend, if I could make a recommendation, is, is not, to leave, not to cultivate a crop, not to um, cultivate a swell and put crop in it and then graze that crop towards the end of the season. I think where things are moving, we, we should best stick, stay away from those critical source areas and just leave them intact, leave them in grass. And I think that might be the end of my slides now, I think. Oh no, I've got one more, sorry, is um, riparian buffers around drains, around um, rivers. They need to be a minimum of five metres. And these um, buffers are really important as they're able to um, um, filter out any runoff that does occur. Um, really important tool there, and that sort of five metres, it is a minimum, but that five to ten metre range it seems to be where things are at their optim, optimum. And um, it's important that they, that stock are temporarily excluded from, from these buffers during that wintering period, because if stock do get into them and start standing on them and eating them and doing some damage, they do start to lose their effectiveness, so it's important that stock are I kept out during that winter grazing period. And um, yes, now I'm handing back over to Olivia. Please. Awesome. Thank you very much, Justin. So as a contractor, you are a very essential part of setting up farms for a successful winter and working with your farmer clients to ensure paddocks are cultivated with the management strategies in place to limit the risk to animals and the environment. So over the next little bit, we're just going to talk about some of those cultivation methods and ways. So as you know, 
cultivation can increase the risk of soil runoff during bad weather. And the nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment and ecology losses from winter forage crops are much higher than those from pasture. And as you can see, there's a really good diagram here in regards to how we can minimize those with the buffers from critical source areas and leaving them uncultivated. The sowing date, as been, you saw earlier on, was mentioned that it has been now as farmers require to re-sow as soon as practical in order to minimize the amount of time that bare ground is exposed to the weather and look at different establishment methods. There will be guidelines in regards to coming out this for more clarity for farmers, which we will share with you in due course. Again, we're not telling you how to do your jobs. At the end of the day, you need to do what is safest for you and your staff. A lot of this is common sense. Cultivating across the slope where possible will lower the risk during rainfall events of water channeling its way like a hydra slide to the bottom, taking seed nutrients and sediment with it. However, this can be managed as we've talked about and Justin's already focused on in regards to those critical source areas and buffers in place. Where grass has run out in this critical source area, there's also options where you could plant a quick growing grass, like a short rotation moata or Italian, or the likes, and that could be put in to increase the effectiveness of a critical source area. If you thought that current critical source area, because it's in a rotation, it's probably a paddock that is being rotated for a reason and going into being put into crop. So you can look at those options to be able to make that critical source area more effective. Also think about considering different cultivation techniques like direct drilling, and it's recommended to be used where possible to minimize the loss of nutrients and sediment movement. Again, not we use the best methods that are suitable for that farm and for the work being done. So when you are getting the map from a farmer on where you are heading to to cultivate this spring, we encourage you to think about questions like, are we leaving a buffer around the creek? Are you happy we don't cultivate the critical source areas? Hopefully these will already be marked on there, but this will help get them thinking if they haven't already thought about it and they can start that change. You are there to do a job and we understand that the client is the one paying your bills. So if that a right out say no to cultivating, right to the creek and make sure you cultivate everything is the direction, note this down in a diary or on the map and take a photo of it. The photo will then have a date on it and if they are pulled up for not complying down the track and try to blame you, you are covered. I'm now going to pass on to Tom Orchison from Beef and Lamb, who's going to talk about some strategic grazing, which links on to the cultivation and the reasonings around it. Great, thanks, Olivia. Um, we'll just go and move on to that next slide. So yeah, one of the key parts um, of this winter grazing is to make sure that you've got a, a written winter grazing plans. Um, a lot of farmers will have uh, winter grazing plans already and they might be in the head. A really key step of that is to encourage them to have a written winter grazing plan. In terms of strategic grazing, uh, this is the, the part of the winter grazing when the animals are actually on, on the paddock. Um, and so there's been research done that would show that um, around up to 80% of environmental losses of sediment and runoff um, can, be, it can be reduced by up to 80%. And as we've heard um, from Justin, um, those critical source areas and the protection of those critical source areas are a key component to make sure um, that those losses um, are being reduced. Directional grazing is um, another part of strategic grazing. Um, and that's basically starting in low risk areas um, of a paddock and moving towards those higher risk areas. And you can see the example in the picture that's there. Um, so starting at the top of the slope and working the animals down towards the bottom and making sure that they're excluded out of that critical source area at the bottom. Um, with directional grazing, it's also possible to move across the slope. You may just need to consider things like using bigger buffer areas around waterways and critical source areas. With the supplementary feed and water troughs, it's important to make sure that they're located in areas that are considered safe, so away from waterways or moving water. Um, and so the, the drier areas of a paddock are the best places to be 
uh, for those supplementary feeds and water troughs, and also um, making sure that um, that the animals uh, have are, are not able to sort of make um, a big mess around those, and that they have um, good access to the supplementary feed and water. Back fencing is another important part of strategic grazing, and that's um, it needs to happen regularly, um, and that that will be determined. Um, you know, whatever is practical in situations um, in different paddocks and different farms. Um, but if, if they are back fenced regularly, it helps to reduce the amount um, of time that the animals can spend remobilizing those sediments and, and the soil, um, and it will help to reduce, uh, reduce the losses. Shelter for stock is also another important consideration that needs to be factored in. Um, and that can be things like shelter belts, um, or it may be um, just using the topography of the land. Um, but it needs to make sure that uh, those are safe areas in terms of um, the animals still can't access those critical source areas. Next slide. Uh, with, the, um, with the strategic grazing, have we got the next slide there? There we go. Um, yeah, this it, is really important to um, think about your plan B options and Dawn will cover this in more detail in her slides coming up, but um, thinking about those areas such as um, sheltered areas or, um, or shelter belts for those adverse events when they come through and keeping some area of the crop available for uh, animals. Uh, so when setting up the paddock, you need to consider the prevailing weather direction um, and that's like we just talked about before with um, providing some shelter to the animals. So that's going to have a big impact on how you might um, set the paddock up. And also uh, placing those bales in the higher ground to reduce soil damage and pugging. Uh, another important thing to consider is the, um, the access to a paddock and placing supplements out prior to winter. If you can reduce the heavy vehicle use and tractor, vehicle, tractor use over winter, um, that's going to be a bonus when, if you can do that when the soil is dry um, rather than taking it through in the winter when the soils are much more wet and they're much more prone to pugging and damage. Um, also keeping, keeping the mob, mob sizes manageable is important um, as that allows uh, you know, better utilisation of the feed that's there and it would also um, make it easier to, uh, to manage the stock that are there. Um, and just as to reinforce that again, yeah, make sure that we're not grazing those critical source areas and keeping the stock out of there and also, um, and also any vehicle use out of there as well. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to Dawn Daly from DRNZ and she's going to talk us through some more options for adverse weather, weather events and um, some other interesting bits and pieces. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so you might be wondering why I'm talking to you um, today about adverse event planning, uh, because I guess this is probably something more to for consideration uh, closer to the winter time. But as we've heard previously, having that um, plan um, and making it early means that it's more likely to be implemented and things can be thought through before we get to winter. So that includes um, having that contingency for adverse weather. And we know that adverse um, weather events are inevitable. Um, I don't think there's been a winter in recent past that we've got through without having some period of intense rain or a snow event or things like that. So really need to be uh, thinking about what that um, what those plans look like. One of the other things when we've been uh, in previous years talking about um, sort of contingency plans and, and planning, it's a lot of it's been around um, the impact of environmental um, or the, the weather on the environmental um, aspects of wintering. However, the Wintering Task Force in, in 2019, um, following that, one of the recommendations was that animal welfare needs to be considered as part of the wintering plan as well. So we've got both the environment and the animal welfare to ensure that we're including in those plans. The other thing, especially for the rural um, contractors um, amongst the group, is that because of this requirement for having an adverse weather plan, that farmers are starting to in innovate uh, and do things a little bit differently with their paddock setup. So it's really important 
um, that I guess your teams understand what they're doing and why they're trying to do it, because that may impact on terms of where you're spraying out or, or where you're cultivating, or as has been mentioned um, previously, the type of um, crop establishment methods um, that are being used as well. So uh, a number of reasons for um, thinking about these adverse plans and, and how you it might impact in terms of the advice you're giving or what you're doing on farm. So one of the questions we um, commonly were, have been getting asked by farmers when we've talked to them about these um, the plan Bs is, well, how do I know when to implement it? Uh, like, what do the conditions look like? Um, yeah, because we can't keep implementing it time and time again through the winter. So uh, as a result of uh, that, we set up a grazing study at the Southern Dairy Hub in winter 2020, where we put a number of behaviour monitoring devices on 120 cows. So half of them were uh, eating kale and the other half were eating fodder beet. And alongside that, we did a range of soil measures to try and um, determine the conditions that the animals were exposed to. So the, the project um, or the study ran for 30 days through um, June and July. And for the soil measures, daily we were out um, there measuring um, the pugging depth. And that was just as simple as using a, a 30 centimetre ruler. We used uh, government scores to determine the wetness had um, a store brook bought a soil moisture probe that um, for soil moisture and also assessed the um, percentage of pooling in the paddock. So took a whole lot of measurements. Um, also, the Ag Research team came out once a week with their um, fancy scientific equipment and uh, did measurements alongside uh, the ones that we were doing at two as the gold standard so we could assess how good our um, in paddock sort of simple measures were compared with um, the, the scientific measures. So what did um, we find from this? So what we observed when we looked at all of the data that um, the lying time of the animals decreased on the day of rain and the day after, but then we saw a rebound in their lying two days after that. So I'll just explain the graphs that are on um, the screen. So the top graph uh, has the day of study along um, the, the, the x-axis and then the blue bars are the, um, the rainfall events and the line, the um, orange line is the, the temperature. So what you can see is early on in the study we didn't have a lot of um, rainfall and during that time um, the lying time which is in the bottom graph, average lying time was fluctuating sort of between eight and sort of 11 hours a day on average. Um, you can see after that event um, on day 10, there was a slight decrease um, in the lying, but the significant event that happened during the study was uh, on day 17, where there was a 12 mil um, rainfall event, followed by a little bit of, of, of cooler weather. And what we saw um, on those on the day of rain, we got about a 50% reduction in the average lying time. And then the day after, you can see their average lying time dropped down to about two to three hours a day. So clearly the conditions of the paddock at that time were not, um, the, the animals weren't finding those, those good lying spots. So on those rainy days, they were having fewer uh, and shorter lying bouts. And then um, when the, the conditions improved, they were lying for longer and therefore then spending less time um, feeding. So when we looked at uh, the measurements that we'd taken in relation to, I guess, our gold standard, our ruler, the gumboot score and the water pooling were all good measures of the true mud depth uh, in the paddock and also the paddock wetness. So for those that are not familiar with the gumboot score, the, um, there's some photos uh, on the slide there. So if when you're walking across the paddock, you can um, you remove your um, foot or take a step and you can still see your um, boot print really easily, that's um, deemed to be dry. If when you move your foot, um, you can still see the boot um, imprint, but maybe it's not as well defined or it's the, the soil's a little bit sticky, that was deemed wet. 
and um, if your boot print completely disappears, um, the sides fall in and um, everything, yeah, there's surface pooling, then that's sodden. So that's, those are the conditions where I'm sure we've all experienced where um, your gum boot may not come with you when you, when you lift your foot. So what we, uh, in terms of the results, the thing that had the biggest impact on the lying time was actually the amount of surface water pooling uh, in the paddock. The other thing that we observed was that um, the area closest to the feed face uh, was the driest. And so uh, this is probably, again, we're having conversations uh, with farmers around the, which direction they're going to be grazing, where does the, uh, the prevailing weather come from, so that um, the crop can be grazed to protect that area during those weather events. And um, particularly in the case with kale, uh, though that kale crop actually provides good protection from the weather if the animals are grazing into it. But what we're trying to do is, um, with the setting up for grazing, is to protect though, that area up by the face so that when the weather has gone through, there's some, some nice um, drier areas that the animals can lie in. Next slide, please. So in terms of the indicators for the um, implementing the plan B, the amount of rain and the number of consecutive days is important. So if there's been a, an event um, and say a couple of days of, of rain and it's still looking like it's going to be wet in the forecast, then the animals are going to be getting tired. So we need to be thinking about um, what alternatives can be what, uh, done at that point. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the proportion of the paddock with water pooling. So when there's more than 17% um, of the available area had pooling of water, uh, lying time dropped below 10 hours a day. And if it was more than 80% of the area, it was less than eight hours a day. And just out of, for context, um, eight hours a day is the, the minimum um, recommended lying time, but um, the, the preference is that animals are getting 10, at least 10 hours a day of lying. Next slide, please. So what are the plan Bs that we've observed that farmers are using? And I guess how do these impact in terms of the, the services that you might be providing to your clients? So the first two um, are ones that have been used um, sort of frequently, um, having extra feed in the feed budget. So for um, extra feed for at least seven days, seven to 10 days. Uh, and during those events, allocating um, fresh area more frequently. Uh, thinking about that in relation to the safety of doing that, it's not quite as, as easy with fodder beet um, because of the, the potential nutritional challenges. But um, yeah, so giving them more drier area up by the face. The other things are looking at um, saving those drier crop paddocks. Um, either with or without shelter for during those events. So this is if um, it's on a farm with a range of soil types or, um, or topography, thinking about um, when, when and how the timing of those paddocks to have some contingency there. As Tom's mentioned earlier, saving those sheltered areas within a paddock for grazing later. So um, maybe having, if you can, um, yeah, keeping those areas rather than grazing them off first. There are, um, for dairy farmers, there are a number that are looking now, oh, have set up um, yards or laneways with rubber matting, whether where they're wintering on the milking platform, so being able to run animals off onto there. Rolling out straw bales, and from a, a contractor's perspective, might create a few challenges um, when it comes to re-establishing that, um, cultivating and re-establishing that paddock, but um, those straw bales will provide an alternative surface for the animals to be lying down on. Now farmers looking at alternative um, within the crop paddock, so um, leaving grass strips, so the photo at the bottom of the slide there, um, about 20% of the paddock was left um, in grass, and so the cows didn't have available that available to them all the time, but when the weather conditions um, were bad, uh, that an area was opened up, so it gave them an alternative surface to lie on. 
The other thing um, Tom talked about, um, keeping your back fence um, moving up regularly. Uh, what we've observed is that um, if you've gone through a period where the weather's been settled, there's actually often some good um, dry lying areas um, back behind the back fence. So if um, there was a couple of days wet, then actually for that period allowing, taking that fence back a bit and giving animals access to those areas. And um, for those that are lucky enough to have um, feed pads and standoff pads are always um, an option for as a plan B. So just really um, to finish up in terms of the plan B considerations, um, they don't have to be complicated. It's um, what we, uh, the, the farmers need to be doing is identifying um, what they can control and then look at what are the management options to be able to control that. We're observing um, lots of innovation and um, yeah, farmers really starting to think outside the square in terms of um, what they could do differently with their paddock setups to, to provide those better conditions during those adverse events. It's really important um, to develop those paddock specific plans because every paddock um, has different uh, risks and opportunities and making sure that all of the team are involved in doing that because they'll have some really good ideas. And as Tom mentioned, making sure that that, that plan is documented, it's written down somewhere so that, um, that, that yeah, it's clear the triggers and um, what needs to be done if there is one of those events. And I just finally, if um, you've got clients that are moving to off paddock uh, systems for those plan Bs, uh, it's ensuring that the standoff rule um, and guidelines are being met both from an environmental and um, an animal welfare perspective. And I'll now hand back uh, to Chris. Thank you. Right, so winter plans for 2022. We're we're zooming in real quick on that one here. So we'll keep it real simple from a farmer's perspective. It's document as you go. And there's some really good um, templates and kits available from Beef and Lamb, Dairy NZ, MPI. And there is support available. So if you don't know if it's something new that you're coming up against, ask questions. There's all the resources we need out there based on all the feedback that we've been working together as an industry to try and support and encourage farmers to have their maps and the bit that they are prepared. So the winter grazing plans, they are the way forward and they don't have to be complicated. But as you can see in the corner there, that is the start of a winter grazing plan. And you can see the circles around the blue bits. Blue bits are where the critical source areas are. So that is taking at a high level straight into where some of the things are you're going to have to start considering. So whether you're the, the farm advisor or the a um, professional you, and help the farmers if they haven't already started latching onto it. What are they going to do about managing some of those areas? And just the fact you've written it down on a piece of paper or put it in a diary on the back of an envelope, start writing it down somewhere and then you can start expending on it. So first of all, you mark out where the, the waterways are, the critical source areas, the shelter, that's critically important. And then later, on the start paging out per paddock, some of the um, mitigations you're going to do at a paddock level. Add in the buffers, what are the non-cultivational areas? Where the water troughs are? Where's the water skin finish? Um, and do you have to put temporary tr water troughs to get access to it? Where's the firm ground on the paddock? We talk about dry, dry land. It's actually where's the firm ground, the free, the free draining? Where's the places you want to go to um, and save for your plan B? But plan B is probably quite good for 48 hours and, or 72 hours. But once it's been wet and it's been going on for a week or two weeks, that is what's going to really stretch the mines. Then there's the grazing direction. Where's it going to be, that bale placement? And keep building. You can just keep on building on the plan. Later on, when there's winter grazing plans come out and uh, part of the freshwater farm plan as a module, you've taken all the simple steps. The farmer's taken the steps, you've been supporting them with the simple and logical stuff. And it doesn't have to be bigger than Ben-Hur, but let's start with those simple steps. And once you get closer to that winter grazing time, then you're thinking more about the detail, what's gonna be going on um, when the weather events 
the what if scenarios and you've broken it down into small and smaller steps that becomes really simple so and if unsure what to do with a particular paddock go to that advice get on that phone and use all the contacts you need that's what there's beef and lamb and dairy and z and far and everyone is there for so the contractors make sure you ask for that plan that doesn't have to be the most complicated but it gives you something to go to and it might actually be part of your defense later on if something went really pear-shaped actually you went per the plan um but you were acknowledging that there was some risky activities there so that's why you didn't go where you uh, the farmer might have wanted you to go a bit closer to the waterway but make sure that there's a plan there as to what looks like a waterway and that you're staying away from it so then we've gone on to the next bit about forage cropping and management plan so there it is it's, it's your plan you do you check you act and then you refine and you come back around again and you just keep on it's just a continuous process so plan from the beginning and then plan according to the plan review and adjust and how did it go and to keep that evidence photos is a really good way of doing it that's more about the farmers and it also can be also for the advisors as well and think about and record what could be done differently next time it's continuous improvement that's what we're there for and it's using those innovations that some farmers have come up with and implementing them across the masses and the more that we all know how to do that whether it was a contract or an advisor and what's working well we'll all make a bigger improvements faster and here's some of the resources that are out there you may very well have seen the one that's right in the very center that are you set for winter it's a seven point guide there and it's a really clear simple language about what those good management practices are but as you can see there's a myriad of resources there and i urge anyone who's not familiar with them to go onto the websites get a copy of it and one of the first points of contact as well as farmers as yourselves making sure that we're all on the same page and together we'll go along make a long way i just want to also clarify a point that i might have mentioned early on it was around waterways and the use of field tiles yes that they would actually be excluded from the existing regulations rather than being included just want to make sure i clarify that so i will now hand back to olivia i believe Cool. Thank you so much, Chris. So before we go into our key messages, we are going to try and combat some of the questions. And we thank you, everybody who has submitted questions already today. And so I am just um, going to make sure I get these right and go through them as we go. So in regards to the question, is that NIWA critical source area GIS layer available to the public? Unfortunately, no, that is not available to the public that we know of. Is there a minimum requirement in the number of wires on a riparian strip? As long as cattle and sheep are effectively excluded from waterways, drains, and critical source areas, then that is fine. There is no minimum wire count from our understanding. And remember that sheep are included in this when it comes to winter grazing uh, and not just grazing in general. Uh, in regards to the can the area and the base area span be just one year of crop or is it continuous? The areas in the base years is it is assessed across an entire farm operation and in regards to if you cropped an area last year in, on and say you did five hectares and you're going to do five hectares again in that same area then that is fine if you are going to look at more than five hectares say six hectares that would be then when you would be actually changing your intensity and would have to potentially look at a consent what's the consensus on annual ryegrass being considered as a winter forage crop um, and that is a um, response, and I have got a policy person sitting in the background helping with these. We are still working with the, ME, with the MFE as industry to provide clarity on this. From what we currently understand, if the crop is a mixture between a fodder crop and a longer term crop, i.e. plantain or ryegrass, then the fodder crop rules do apply. Uh, so there was a couple of questions there for you, Dawn. Uh, so we'll bring you back on now as well. And one of them was, would the soil moisture be a better measure than the two consecutive days of rain? Um, yeah, great question. What we found was that with the soil moisture, it got to the point that it was saturated. 
um, and that was using just a, a, a MITRE 10 soil moisture probe. We couldn't get it sensitive to enough to um, be able to predict um, what the lying conditions were going to do. So it really came back to, from all of the things that we looked at, it was actually the amount of rainfall and the surface water pooling that were critical in terms of um, affecting the lying times. Awesome, thanks Dawn. And then there was another question there. Are there any concerns or issues with requiring effluent capture if yards or laneways with rubber matting essentially being used as a standoff pad? Yes, definitely. And that was the comment that I did make um, right at the end. But if um, yeah, yards and the laneways that we've seen being used are sort of the ones right close to the shed that have, um, have um, effluent capture to them um, and into the pond anyway. But yes, definitely if they're being used, that need to be making sure that the effluent is being captured and disposed of appropriately. And will the back fencing have a negative impact on lying time? In terms of the back fencing, if you're keeping your back fence up too close, uh, then that will potentially have a, an impact on or negative impact on lying time because um, we need to make sure that the cows have got enough space to actually be able to, or the, the animals have got enough space to be able to spread out and lie down. So when we go off paddock, we recommend that they need to have at least eight square metres per cow. And so the same would apply um, in paddock. One of the things that we did observe um, in the study was there were a number of animals that over the 30 days of the trial did not achieve on average eight hours a day of lying. When we looked at who they were, they were the younger and earlier calving animals. So probably lower um, in the, the pecking order. And so, the, um, and the ones that were getting really high lying times were the older animals. So yes, we need to think about what the area is that's available to them. Awesome, thank you so much, Dawn. And Justin, we'll now bring you up in regards to a few questions relating to your slides in regards to critical source areas. Um, is there a distance requirement for keeping away from critical sources, critical source areas when drilling a crop? Uh, no, um, but at the moment, no. What I understand is that with um, the change, potential changes to the rules, some guidance material will be coming out. And I think that's an important question that needs to be addressed with that guidance material. And that also guidance material will also help in regards to that correct buffer size for steeper slopes. But obviously, again, some common sense prevails there in regards to the minimum is that five metres um, in regards to a waterway. Obviously, if you've got a bit of a steeper slope, taking some common sense to make that a little bit bigger where practical. Yeah, or well, looking at some alternatives such as um, sediment traps as well could be an advantage. Cool, thank you very much. I think the majority of them have been covered. Again, we haven't mentioned all the every possible solution here today, guys. Um, so in regards to, yeah, um, a comment was made in regards to why foraging in winter, the being key reason missed, we have a 100 day winter in, in, South, in the South Island. Um, and yeah, we're well aware of that. And that could be, the, that may be the key reason. Again, we're just making sure that they're, when you're going with your paddock selection, that you're really thinking about the process and what actually is happening in those paddocks. But we're now gonna just um, summarize today and um, give you a chance to um, have another little bit of a feedback as well. Uh, so really just the key messages from today is to really encourage everybody out there to start getting that written plan now. Uh, not only from a compliance point of view, but being able to assess those risks and actually as a whole business plan, it's going to help the business as a whole. It's also, if we look down the farm assurance side of things, it's actually going to be able to help from that aspect as well. So having a written plan now will help into the future no matter what. And it all starts at paddock selection. We cannot emphasize this enough in regards to uh, if the better paddocks that are selected in the, at the first will make a huge difference when we come to this time of year. And getting those critical source areas right now is really critical. Making sure you have, they, farmers have clear cultivation plans is a key to success. It's not gonna, only gonna make every, um, the job in the winter, a lot easier, but is also going to make a job as a rural contractor a lot easier understanding what those clear things, things are in regards to what they need to be doing and 
where they are going to cultivate. Make a plan, record it, do it, review it. It's what we want to be encouraging farmers going forward. And right, and I'm sure a lot of them are already doing this. We've seen a number of them already starting down this farm plan process. Encourage people to ask questions if unsure. And that goes for you guys as professionals and rural contractors. As I said, none, we're not experts in this. We are just wanting to make sure that everybody goes, is along for the conversation and that feels like they have the support to be able to support farmers at the end of the day. Well-being, as you're aware, the pressures and anxiety around wintering can be high, especially with the public perceptions out there. And as you are talking to farmers, keep a lookout for well-being signs and don't be afraid to ask how they're going overall, which we know as RPs you are already doing. And so just keep up that great work. Remember, there's also always great resources out there for both your teams and the farmers' teams uh, to go through and like with, with the Rural Support Trust and FarmStrong. Again, I thank every one of you for taking up your valuable time. As we know, even though lockdown, we are all in lockdown, that the rural sector continues to thrive away and everybody still has a very full plate of jobs on the cards. I will wish you all the best for the spring ahead and let's hope that the sunshine gets those pastures going and wish you all the best in being able to share these messages throughout the industry in regards to making winter a great place and let's hope that we can get this right going years and years forward. Thank you very much everybody.